Hi, my name is Dr. Kat Fies, and this is video B of the series of videos on the heart. We will focus on the external anatomy of the heart. The heart is made up of four major chambers, and we refer to these chambers as the left and right atria, singular atrium. So if I label these, this is your right atrium and this is your left atrium. And then we have the much bigger chambers, which are your right ventricle and your left ventricle. Now, the atria are referring to the actual spaces inside of these rather flappy looking like structures in the brown. And these flappy ears we tend to refer to as oracles, literally meaning the ears of the atria. Notice too that separating the atria from the ventricles, we see uh, major blood vessels that feed the heart. We'll talk about those later, those coronary vessels. Um, but they sit in these grooves um, in between the atria and the ventricles and even in between the ventricles. So these grooves we can refer to as sulky or singular sulcus. This should ring a bell because you saw that term in brain anatomy as well. So just for example, a groove in between an atrium and a ventricle, we can call an atrioventricular sulcus, while a sulcus in between two ventricles, we would call an interventricular sulcus. We call that the term inter always means in between. Okay. When we look at the heart anteriorly, this is when we can really see how twisted the heart is. And this is what I'm referring to in, at the top in bold. What that is trying to tell you is that when you look at the heart anteriorly, you actually see almost all of the right chambers. But you see only a small portion of the left chambers. So the left chambers are twisted towards the back, towards the posterior aspect of the heart. And when we look at a posterior view, you will see that. Now let's focus on the major arteries that, first of all, leave the heart. And for this, we'll start with the aorta. And I'm going to pick a better color so that we don't get so confused with reds and blues and, and all of that. So let me switch to a, a dark green here. So we see the aorta right here. And our second major artery is what we call the pulmonary trunk. You can see them um, labeled here as well, aorta and pulmonary trunk. And we can give, oops, I misspelled aorta there. Let's fix that. We can um, give more specific names to portions of the aorta. As you can already see here, this short section is referred to as the ascending aorta. Then we have the arch of the aorta and we could continue to draw the aorta um, and say that we have our descending aorta continuing down the thorax, going down through the diaphragm into the abdomen and eventually even splitting into the lower limbs. I'll just call them legs to make it easier to write. Where does the blood come from that enters into the aorta? Well, that blood actually arises from the left ventricle, from the left ventricle and gets ejected into the aorta. The aorta gives rise to three major fingers, as I often will refer to them. And you will need to know these three major branches. We have a short stubby branch called the brachiocephalic trunk. You'll see many blood vessels are referred to as a trunk when they look like they form the trunk of a tree because 
<clears throat> this brachiocephalic trunk is very rapidly going to split into these two branches. I will label these branches in just a moment. So I just pointed out our brachiocephalic trunk as our first major finger. Then we have the left common carotid artery. Watch your spelling for carotid. And finally, the left subclavian artery. If you look at the names of all these different uh, arteries, subclavian meaning going underneath the clavicle on its way to the arm, by the way, Carotid might not be um, as explanatory to you, but I know from, the, I'm quite sure that all of you know that carotid arteries feed into the brain or into the head. And then brachiocephalic literally tells you brachio arm cephalic going to the head. Anytime vessels are specified as, for instance, in this case, left, you can automatically assume that there must be a right version of that particular vessel. Notice that the brachiocephalic trunk does not have right or left in its name and that means there isn't, um, there aren't two versions of this trunk. We only have the brachiocephalic trunk um, on the most uh, right portion coming off of the aorta. But what we do see is that this brachiocephalic trunk immediately splits into the right subclavian artery, I'll abbreviate them here, and the right common carotid artery. So we have right versions of these left arteries. This clearly shows you <clears throat> that there's a bit of asymmetry in all of these blood vessels. Be sure you know all of these vessels I just pointed out. So all of this blood that leaves the left ventricle gets pumped into the aorta and from the aorta the blood is pumped pretty much to every part of the body except the lungs. So we have a whole separate artery that carries blood into our lungs and that artery is called the pulmonary trunk. Notice that this artery is colored blue. We'll talk about definitions of arteries and veins in just a moment. The pulmonary trunk carries its blood it carries its blood to our left lung, LL for left lung, and to the right lung via, as you can see, a pulmonary oops, I meant to um, use my cursor there via a pulmonary artery that um, goes to the left lung, so therefore called the left pulmonary artery. And then we also have here our right pulmonary artery. Gas exchange occurs in the lungs, and the kind of gas exchange that occurs in the lungs is such that the lungs will supply the blood with oxygen. And consequently, we will see that the blood that leaves the lungs will be oxygen rich. That blood will return to the heart via pulmonary veins, which we see entering here on the back side of the heart. These pulmonary veins that I'm pointing to right now, all of them will return their blood to the left atrium. So despite the fact that it's, it seems on this figure that the right pulmonary veins dump their blood in this atrium, that's not the case. They actually are sitting on the back of the heart here and they all enter into the left atrium. From the left atrium, this blood that is now oxygen rich will make it to the left ventricle. And of course, as you know, from the left ventricle, the blood enters the aorta and the aorta carries that oxygen rich blood to all the tissues that need it. Okay, so we've learned about the two major arteries and I've also introduced you to some veins, namely our pulmonary veins, which carry oxygen-rich blood. <clears throat>
we have two other major veins to point out. And these are veins that return blood to the heart inferiorly from the lower portion of the body, meaning everything below the heart, and um, superiorly from everything above the heart. We call them the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. This is the blood that visited all of the body tissues. The blood that the aorta pumped out visited all the tissues, the tissues picked up the oxygen, and then the oxygen poor blood returns to the heart via the inferior vena cava and via the superior vena cava. And this blood, which is oxygen poor, will get dumped into the right atrium. Into the right atrium. From there, that blood from the right atrium is going to make it into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, the blood will then be pushed into the pulmonary trunk, which will then take it again to the lungs, where it can become supplied with fresh oxygen. We will review the flow of blood substantially in another video, but what we can do here is clarify some terminology. First of all, let's define atrium. A chamber that is called atrium is always going to collect blood. So I'm just going to t uh, write out collect so I run, do not run out of space for some of the other definitions. On the other hand, ventricles, they eject blood. So ventricles, they eject blood. Keep that in mind. If you keep these definitions in mind, you will not get confused about where blood goes when. Arteries are always defined as blood vessels that um, carry blood away from the heart. So they carry blood away from the heart. While veins, on the other hand, return blood to the heart. Do not define arteries based on whether they are oxygen-rich or oxygen-poor vessels. Let's take a look at why you should not do that. Our aorta is an artery, and it's colored red because it has oxygen-rich blood. But we give it the name, or we say that the aorta is an artery because it carries blood away from the heart. Let's take a look now at the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk carries its blood from the right ventricle to the left lung and to the right lung. I just made that a bit messy there, but my point is notice that the, the pulmonary trunk plus the pulmonary arteries are colored blue. These vessels carry oxygen poor blood, despite the fact that they're considered arteries. And why are they considered arteries? Because they carry blood away from the heart. Here we see our pulmonary veins, colored red. They return their blood to the left atrium. Remember, an atrium always collects blood. And they're colored red because they're oxygen rich. They just, they contain the blood that just left the lungs. The lungs supply the blood with fresh oxygen. Yet they're called veins. Veins always return blood to the heart, more specifically to the atria. Arteries that leave the heart always receive blood from the ventricles. Your, your inferior and superior vena cavae are colored blue because they carry oxygen poor blood and they return blood to the heart which is why they are considered to be veins. I should point out one more structure and that's this little white connective tissue right here that interconnects the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. In Once we're born this is just connective tissue that replaced something that was there 
as we were developing as a fetus. At that time, this structure allowed for blood to travel between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And you will see why this is when you learn about fetal circulation. We refer to the structure in a fully developed heart as the ligamentum arteriosum. Here now we're looking at the posterior side of the heart. And remember, if we're now looking at the posterior side, that means that when we look at the right side of the heart, it's really the right side, if you follow me here. So this is our right ventricle. Here is our left ventricle. Here is our right atrium. And here is our left atrium, right about here. Lots of coronary vessels. Once again, we'll get to those later on. But the point to make with this particular image is the following, or the points are the following. For one, we see most of the left side of the heart in this view. So the left side of the heart points mostly posteriorly. Secondly, you can now clearly see how all of the pulmonary veins that return oxygenated blood back to the heart do that by returning the blood to the left atrium right here. And then finally, we also see how the inferior and superior vena cavae enter the right atrium. We're now ready to review the coronary circulation of the heart, which consists once again of arteries and veins. We'll start with the anterior view and point out the location of the aorta, which of course is this big structure right here. From the base of the aorta, from the base of the aorta, we see two major arteries arising. And these are referred to as the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. The left coronary and the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery, this is again an anterior view, will right away start snaking down that sulcus that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. That, atrio, that right atrioventricular sulcus to then wrap around to the back as it follows that sulcus. Our left coronary artery is also going to give rise to a branch that descends into this interventricular sulcus and we will refer to it as the anterior interventricular artery, this one right here. Its other branch will continue in the sulcus that separates our um, left atrium from our um, left ventricle. And in that sulcus, then, we call the vessel the circumflex artery. And it gets that name because it will literally continue in that sulcus to the back. It kind of bends around like circumflex to bend around. We'll continue with the arteries, the coronary arteries, on the next slide. But since we have this anterior view here on the screen, I'm going to go ahead and add the major veins that you have to know. In the sulcus in which the anterior interventricular artery sits, we also see a major vein that drains the heart and we call that the great cardiac vein. So in the interventricular sulcus, we have our major anterior and interventricular artery and then our great cardiac vein. In the sulcus that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle, we have the small cardiac vein. So now we're looking at the posterior side of the heart. And so to not get confused, Let's label our major atria. Since this is an interventricular sulcus on the posterior side, we can label this as the right ventricle. Let me use a different color. The right ventricle, the right atrium here, the left atrium there, and the left ventricle here. 
So let's first focus on the arteries. Remember that we have that circumflex artery bending around the heart, and here we see it. It eventually descends here, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for those smaller um, coronary vessels. I'll mark the one that you have to know, or ones that you have to know. So you have to know that circumflex artery. Also, remember, we also learned on the anterior side that right coronary artery, it also stays in that atrioventricular sulcus to then give rise to a minor or smaller coronary artery here. And another important one that I do need for you to know in that interventricular sulcus on the posterior side, and so it is referred to as the posterior interventricular artery meaning it sits in between the ventricles on the posterior side. So those are your coronary arteries. Let's finish now with the, the veins. I introduced you to the great cardiac vein on the posterior side, and notice that it also takes advantage of that sulcus, and then it merges with this very wide... Um, sac-like vein, which we call the coronary sinus. When we use the term sinus amongst blood vessel, it implies a very thinly thin sac-like type of vessel. It doesn't really look like a tube much. It looks kind of more like a, a sac. This picture doesn't really uh, show that, but in real life it is that way. So all of the blood that um, has been nourishing the heart and now has lost its oxygen is eventually returned to that coronary sinus. And that coronary sinus is going to return that oxygen poor blood into the right atrium. Because from the right atrium then, that oxygen poor blood will make it into the right ventricle and the right ventricle will push that oxygen poor blood into the pulmonary trunk where, um, from where the blood will eventually make it to the lungs to get reoxygenated. So don't forget the blood from the coronary sinus via a small opening will actually drain into the right atrium somewhere around here. There is one more cardiac vein to point out that takes its blood into the coronary sinus, and that is this one right here, which we call the middle cardiac vein. On the anterior side, we have the great cardiac vein that bend around and appears here in that atrioventricular groove, but in the interventricular groove on the posterior side, sitting pretty much parallel to the posterior interventricular artery, we find the middle cardiac vein. Okay, so quick summary. The heart muscle tissue itself must be supplied with oxygen-rich blood, and that happens with the help of our left and right coronary arteries and their branches the left and the right coronary arteries arise from the aorta. The oxygen poor blood that starts to accumulate needs to be drained, and that is drained with the help of the coronary sinus, which in turn dumps the blood into the right atrium, and from there, of course, the blood can eventually be reoxygenated in the lungs. So this wraps up our external anatomy.